Well, why the face? Mm. Why are you pulling that face? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we had a great conversation today about reading your face. So I've always been intrigued about the body and how it's so reflective of our inner world and our outer world. Um, palm reading, I love. Yeah, she you know. used to do a ton of that. Yes, right? yeah. and just you know, in Chinese medicine, how like your whole body can be mapped out on your ears and just that reflection of like organs and emotions. Like there's just so much to it. But this was something new that I hadn't、um, learned about yet.、Mm -hmm. So why the face? We did a, a, a wonderful interview with、uh, the author of this book. He's named Dr. Todd Frisch, and he wrote this book with his daughter,、uh, Abby Frisch. And the beautiful thing about this individual is, is this is a doc who's been in practice for you know decades, and now he's sort of shifted gears out of one-to-one、uh, -one practice and starting to teach other doctors how to do this, how to. Read the face, but not just doctors. I mean, this book is for anybody that wants to learn a little bit more about how to understand how the body changes and, and how the body changes actually shows up as a reflection of different,、um, you know, maybe different lines that show up on the face, or furrowing, or like indentations in different areas. Your, your body is constantly speaking to you,、mm -hmm. and and there's so much wisdom in being able to read. The signs of how the body communicates,、mm -hmm. and the biggest message that I hope everyone、um, taps into is the message of hope that we step into with、um, Dr. Todd, and just how great it is to have a mentor like him around to show us that、um, there's possibility and opportunity when we diagnose this. We use these、um, kinds of methods for diagnosis, not only just for that, but just for life itself. Yeah. So tune in and check out the book if you can. And、uh, there's another episode on the Doctor Dads, which you can also check out as well. So enjoy. Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Health Ignited with、uh, Doctor Sonia Jensen and myself. And we are here today, having、uh, about to have a, an amazing conversation with a doctor who we've interviewed before, and his name is Doctor Todd Frisch, and he wrote the book.、Uh, WTF, WTF, which is not what you think it is. It's actually why the face, and not the other one that you may be thinking. And in this, this this book is an absolute gem.、Uh, I love it. I love the whole philosophy. I find it so easy to read for people who are, you know, whether they are, are not doctors, whether they are. It gives enough of a background into Chinese medicine and just the whole whole understanding of facial diagnosis with. Uh, philosophy with like practical application, and the fact that、uh, Dr. Todd,、uh, who was a re retired chiropractor, not really retired. I mean, he's still constantly putting content out and and、uh, innovating, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But he actually wrote the book with his daughter, which is super cool.、Mm -hmm. So,、uh, Todd, thank you so much for coming back to visit with Dr. Sonia and myself. Thank.、Oh. Todd's accidentally muted himself. There we go. There he is. Todd's here. Hi. <laughs> Now you can only read that book on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, though. So that's、uh, <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> It's a good way to pace yourself, though, right? You know, you only have three yeah, days of the week where you dig in, and then the rest you got off.、And、then it's integration yeah, time. There you go. There you go. So thank you so much for for being here with us again. Doc,、uh, it's it's a real pleasure to have you here. And、uh, you you recently did a, a facial reading for Sonia as well, and it was illuminating for her. And and、uh, one of the things that that she loved to repeat to me a couple times <laughs> was something along the lines, and I'm paraphrasing here, but、uh, something about being one of the more powerful female、uh, fa <laughs> facial diagnoses that you've done. And she she just wanted to keep repeating that to me. And the, the other one I repeated to him was the adrenal insufficiency due to a male in、uh, my life,、right. stress <laughs> from a male in my life. Yeah. yeah, because there's only one male in her life. It must have been me,、right. I guess. Right. Yeah. Anyways, still, thank you so much for being here. You bet. I'm still waiting for that check because you want me to say that in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I could be bought. <laughs> So、um, yeah, let's let's get into、um, you know why why facial diagnosis like why did you find this to be such a powerful tool? And for those of you who are tuning in for the first time here, Dr. Todd, we did do a podcast with him 
uh, on the Dr. Dad's podcast, we get into a little bit more of his backstory. But just for people in this in this episode, tell us a little bit more about uh, facial diagnosis and and why it's an important. It became an important tool in your tool belt. You know, we as physicians were we're taught to ask what's wrong, and that's great. And when you know what's wrong, and you have a, a definitive diagnosis, then you can shoot for the bullseye. The problem is, especially in our world where people tend to come to us after they've tried lots of other things, uh, they come with a lot of symptoms, but nothing's wrong medically. So I came to the conclusion through just observation that you've got to be two thirds sick before medicine sees anything wrong. So once you cross the two thirds line, now the, the it's obvious the blood test show the abnormalities, but you have the female, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, um, acne around her cycle, um, gas and bloating and, and uh, doesn't sleep and it's not menopausal and everything's normal. So is it a lack of Prozac? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, so I, I had a paradigm shift where I realized I need to look at my, my patients and ask what's not right. Well, the problem is <clears throat> there's nothing out there to determine what's not right. So there's now though, <laughs> it's called WTF. Uh, so I, I began... I was always interested in traditional Chinese medicine, five element theory. I studied the Hermetic. I studied astrology. I studied everything I put my, put my eyes to, to help me understand what's not right. Um, I found most, uh, because I'm a voracious reader and I love books, I found most data in, in Chinese medicine. And it just took off from there. I bought a book in 1982 called, I can't remember. Secrets, Secrets, of the Secrets of the Face. Horrible book. Just absolutely awful book. It poorly written. Absolutely no uh, editor involved in this thing. But it got me intrigued with this. I now own over 80 books on facial diagnosis, the majority of which talk about personality. I wanted something that talked about physiology. So when you see a certain mark on the face, um, it'll tell us there's a weakness, say, in the liver or the gallbladder or the pancreas or whatever it might be. So <clears throat> number one, it was to see what was not right instead of what's wrong, because oftentimes when you cross the two thirds line, it's a little too late. Secondly, in our book um, and in, in the books I have, uh, there's, it depends on the book, there's anywhere from six to nine face shapes. I went with the nine, they have lots of different names, but I wanted to communicate with my patient. Uh, and I found that if I could dance to the music that was played in there, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's our big dog. Uh, he's he's got a he's a no, it's, um, it's he's a fire face. Snow falling off the roof. <laughs> it's, he's a fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so if I'm talking to a fire face, and that's a triangular face shaped like this, I'm a bucket face. I'm shaped like a bucket. So, do not play bucket faces in Trivial Pursuit because they'll kill you because we like to put things in our bucket and we like to know about everything. But a fire face, if they're coming in and I do an assessment on them, I can't say to them, look, you got five things wrong and we got to jump on this right now because you're in trouble. We got to do this right now. If we don't do this, you're in big trouble. They're never going to come back. What you have to say to them, look, you've got four or five things wrong and we can't treat all five of them because you're just too sensitive because fire faces, their key is they're sensitive. Not only can't we treat, uh, we're only going to treat one and, and we're going to start with a half dose because we're going to see how you do. And you'll watch that patient literally melt in front of you because they'll just, you can just pick up the energy and they'll, the energy is, oh my goodness, somebody finally understands me. So I am often asking people to do things that are not, um, standard medical care, if I'm putting someone on some kind of supplement or if I'm asking to do a certain uh, eating um, a program, they're not used to that. They're used to taking a pill in Western medicine. So I need to get in and I want, I want patient compliance. So I, I dance with the music that they're playing and all of a sudden they have success in it and it's, and it's awesome. So patient compliance is the other aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it really builds up trust between doctor and patient and just that knowing that all of us, uh, no matter what shape face we have, who we are, we want to be seen and heard and to be, to be able to step in front of someone and feel that connection is so Absolutely. important. Absolutely. And people, people want to know you're listening. And when they, you know, I would have people come in because you develop a reputation. I have people come in, I understand you can tell me what's wrong without me telling you what's wrong. And I go, well, not, not really. 
well, tell me. And so you you nail a couple of things. And even if you're wrong on three of them and you're right on one, they, they don't remember the three you're wrong on. They remember the one you're right on. But it is about, um, it, there's something I, I teach other doctors a lot now at this point in my career. And um, when I when I was young and brilliant, only one of those adjectives was accurate, but <laughs> um, I had mentors in my life that I didn't realize were trying to mentor me because I was young and brilliant. And, uh, and now <clears throat> at this point in my life, if somebody wants to mentor me, I'll suck the brains out of their head. <laughs> I will accept any kind of mentoring. But one of the things I teach uh, young practitioners now is what I refer to as a faith circuit. And, and what this is, is you have to have faith in what you're doing. And the only way you get and continue having faith is you continue to learn. You, you, we're not, we don't come out of school full grown. We, we have to grow and we have to continue to grow. And we have actually never stop growing because that's called dead. So if you have faith in what you do, when someone walks into the room and you pay attention to them, you look them in the eye and you, you touch them and shake their hand and just let them feel your energy and you feel their energy, they have faith in you. And that completes this faith circuit. And then you've got to be a complete moron to screw up and not help them get well. The process of healing is just really about, um, about communication and understanding that so much communication is not done uh, you know, orally, it, it is done with the energy that's there. We all, we all pick up people's energy. We all do facial diagnosis. When, when your child comes down in the morning, you say, don't you feel good today? What did you see that morning? You didn't see the morning before. So this facial diagnosis is something we all do. We just, uh, we just put some legs to it. My daughter, Ab <coughs> my daughter, Abby and I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And one of the things I think that some people might have a, a difficult time with appreciating is that how can you, or how, yeah, how can you gather information from just looking in the face, you know, and I was trying to you know, help people maybe appreciate this is that you can tell when someone's angry, they furrow their brow and, you know, there's a certain look about them and th that would be an angry face. And obviously a, a happy face would, would be a smile. Uh, but over time, you know, based on different traumas and things like that, the, the, the face shape will change. And there's, there's a part in your book which showed uh, young men before they went to war and they and you saw just this, you know, vitality in their skin and the look of like, you know, youthfulness mm -hmm. And then just within a couple of years, they looked like they aged like 30 years. And we see this with like presidents or prime ministers or, or, you know, people that are in very stressful situations. And then the face starts to furrow or like indent or starts to show up to some signs. And so, you know, it's, it's not that hard to believe that the face does change based on the exposures, the stressors, the internal battles and things like that. But how do you help people appreciate that? Um, you know, I mean, obviously a picture is worth a thousand words in those kind of situations, yeah, yeah. but uh, that, that's the, a big deal. The pictures with those soldiers, they were six months apart. They were before they left for Afghanistan, while they were there and upon their return. Yeah. So this dramatic yeah. change occurred in, in, uh, in a six month period of time. You know, if you go right back to embryology, which I'm not trying to get unbelievably basic, but there's a sperm and an egg and the sperm is flying all over the place and the egg has got this pulse and the sperm's got this really fast pulse. And actually Life Magazine in the 70s filmed uh, uh, the um, fertilization of an ovum. It was fast. I remember as a kid watching it. Uh, it was just uh, absolutely amazing. But anyway, the sperm, once it fertilizes that ovum, this really rapid pulse in this 72 beat egg, women are always more calm than us men. <laughs> Um, when, that, when that hits, the, for a moment, there is, there's, a, there's nothing for that moment. And then all of a sudden, they both beat together. And very quickly, that one, that one cell forms two, and the two, four, and the four, eight, and the eight forms 16 cells. And that's called a marola. That's a buckethead comment. We remember that from embryology class in school. But, but we start from one cell. So how, how is it a stretch to think that a microsystem would exist. We, we started with one cell. We all know about foot reflexology, hand reflexology. In acupuncture, there's something called auricular therapy where you can actually treat the entire body on the ear. Yeah. I studied with Dr. Jensen, um, the, the, uh, the American uh, authority on, on uh, iridology, and the whole body is mapped out in the iris. And everybody thinks it's so bizarre, but 
how can it be bizarre? We start from one cell. The, everything's connected. Why, why would it be a big step to understand that the body would mark things on the face? So if you make a furrowed brow, yes, that is anger. And what is, and then in Chinese medicine, there's something called five elements. And the emotion of the of the wood element is anger and the wood element is liver gallbladder. So when you see the furrow here that is formed when I have an angry look, that's telling us there's a liver involvement in that person. So it again, it's not a quantum leap in, in belief system. It's strange only because people don't know it or understand it. It's kind of like when we when we went into Kuwait uh, or Iran, Iraq, and they had these um, they had these roadsides that were just like the United States that with the with the the green signs with the white letters, except they had all these squiggly lines that I couldn't understand. That's because I don't understand uh, how to read Arabic, but once you know how to read it, all of a sudden it becomes very simple. And really, face diagnosis is very simple if you just put a little bit of effort into it and realize there's some commonality to all these books that I have read. <clears throat> and then with regard to the to the uh, to what parts of the body represent, uh, what parts of the face represent one, what part of the body, it becomes obvious. I just did an interesting. Um, diagnosis on a gal. Um, it was a shape practitioner, a company called Shape Reclaimed. Um, and she had this amazing, unhealthy look right here. And, and it was so bad that I felt there were degenerative changes in the lung, because this area represents lungs, the cheek represents lungs. And when I looked at her eyes, the right eye and the left eye, the right eye is what we show to the world. It's our public persona, it's our mother's influence. The left eye is our uh, inner, true, or private self, and it's her father's influence. But in her right eye, there was despair. And that's not what most people show to the world. Now, the, the emotion of the lung is despair and sadness and sorrow. And, and I, I was very uncomfortable giving her the diagnosis because I really felt there was something degenerative going on in her lung. And I let her open it up. She was very guarded as I was uh, walking through the diagnosis. And when I went to the lung area, uh, I began explaining what's going on. And I said, I, you know, I've got some concerns with the lung. <clears throat> and uh, she opened up and it turns out um, they adopted a, a teenager who one night got up and uh, decided to kill her and her husband and shot her in the back. And, uh, do you think that created some despair? And it marked on the face. It was just a remarkable uh, thing that you can see on the face and it shouldn't be ignored. And it, do you think that could interfere with her body's ability to heal? Do you think that could cause a whole bunch of symptoms like immune? Could it, what, what else could it cause? You know, so um, it, it's fascinating what you can pick up. And if you let, you, you don't, you don't walk through a door, um, I wouldn't say you have you had sexual abuse. I, it's never comfortable to bring it up. I will see it often in facial diagnosis, but I won't bring it up because oftentimes the person that has been abused has buried that thing so deep they're not even where it happened. But once they bring it up, then you can say, okay, this is this is what's going on. So there's a, a gentleness to facial diagnosis that has to be respected. You can't just go in there and say, boom, you got this because it can kind of freak people out. So if you go into it gently and help them understand it's not abnormal that we all do it, it becomes a great, um, a great mechanism of connecting with your patient, and they will refer. <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're a young doctor trying to build a practice, my goodness, give me Shape Reclaim, this, this company I have, and face diagnosis, and put me in any town in this nation, and I, I will have a monster practice in two years. I, I will, and I'll, and I, and it's not about income. I, I, You've heard me speak in the previous one. There's only two kinds of doctors. Those that love people and use money and those that love money and use people. Don't be the latter. Takes me off. I don't like it. Uh, so, you know, when you're helping people and then you get paid for it on top of it, what, 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 what better job on earth could there be? This is an exciting thing for me. 
Yeah, and I really want to circle back to that gentleness that you were speaking to. And I really felt that when you read my face and we're going through what you saw and, you know, Nick and I were talking that evening. So back in 2007, I went through some real stressful times and a divorce and my face completely changed. So I wasn't, um, you couldn't describe me as that fire face. My face actually used to be really round and my cheeks Mm -hmm. were fuller and the, the lung stuff that you, that showed up on my right cheek was during that time, I had a chronic cough when I went through that mm-hmm. stress. And then we were living in Taiwan. There's a lot of pollution and all these things. So I think um, that gentleness that you speak to really does allow space for the individual to then reflect on how connected everything is and how connected our mm-hmm. emotional body is to our physical body and how it's constantly trying to just speak to us so that we can create change because we look at our face every single day so we can visibly see that what we're moving through at that time is really affecting our entire system. And that I think is, can be really empowering too, that change can happen to create maybe more stress, but it can also happen to create um, healing in the body as well. Absolutely. You know, I, I write about this. <clears throat> my daughter um, just took what's in my brain and put it in, in a book form. If I, <laughs> if I had wrote the book, it'd be 9,000 pages. And <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but she uh, broke the book up with what are called life lessons, which I, I, when I saw it, I literally burst into tears, you know, cause she kind of took it and I said, look, you got, you got complete artistic control, choose the colors, choose whatever, which kind of blew her away. Cause that's not my, <laughs> that's not my makeup to do that. But uh, we tell a story in the book about um, when I, when I would have difficult patients and, you know, Sadly, um, we're often the last resort for a lot of people because we do this alternative medicine. I hate that term. Um, uh, we call it functional medicine. No, I hate that term. But we should call it restorative medicine, which is what it is. We were trying to restore people back to a place of health. They should have never left in the first place. But when I would have a difficult patient, I would always get up very early in the morning. I'd get my cup of tea and my dog, and I'd go up in my loft at my big antique roll top desk. And I, I'm a believer in prayer. Uh, if that offends somebody, get over it because it's just where I stick my stick in the can. I'm not asking you to do that, but, um, but I would pray and I would, uh, I would simply, I had this wall of books and I would, uh, I had this guy who had um, a neurological disorder who I never did help by the way. Um, but it was a really tough case. And I, I simply prayed about him and I would walk to my books and with my eyes closed and I would just wait till I felt something. What did you feel? I don't know. I felt something. <laughs> and I would grab a book. I wouldn't even look at it. Put it underneath my arm. I'd carry it back to my desk. I'd spin through it with my eyes closed and I'd stop and I'd start reading. I cannot tell you how many times I got the exact answer I needed. However that whole system works, I do not know if it's a woo-woo to some people. That's okay. It just kind of worked for me. But the book I grabbed this particular morning was Medical Embryology. And I'm reading about a sperm and an egg. We just, just talked about that. And I'm thinking... God, <laughs> this isn't helping me here. And as I was reading about this, um, it, it it talked about at a certain point in the embryological development, we were talking about our 16 cell embryo, which is this Marola, and then it's 32 and, and 64 and 128. It just keeps growing and growing. And in this mass amount of multiplication of cells, this proliferation of cells, there's a black mass that forms in the middle. And that mass, <clears throat> as the cellular proliferation continues, separates, and there's a tentacles that connect this top black mass to the bottom black mass. The top becomes the brain, the bottom becomes the heart. So the power in that message that for me that morning wasn't to help this doctor, it was to help me. We don't think with our head, we think with our head and our heart because they're embryologically from the same tissue. They're they're connected and they never disconnect. We men have a harder time connecting. Women have a much better and easier time connecting uh, their head and their heart. So when my wife says, I feel this, and I'm thinking, geez, I never felt that. I'm never going to feel that. But I have to respect the fact that she does have a greater connection in that head heart type thing. So the point of this, uh, this whole story is that even though um, I had nothing for that patient, that that moment in my life uh, changed my life. And I began looking at everybody certainly with my head and as a bucket head, I, I love thinking, but I also had to look with the heart and that's where the gentleness came into my world. And, and it was more important for me to, to 
be there for what they needed instead of an agenda I had. I didn't have that that peg that I had to shove through whatever hole I wanted to push it through. I, I, I realized there were many different holes and many different shapes and then I had to find the right spot. And that's <clears throat> that was the basis of my whole healing approach. That was a long but, run for a short joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, can, can we, let's dive into a little bit of the shape reclaimed work. Like, can you, can you describe that to people sure. a little bit and in how you train doctors and, and yeah, give us some insight into that, uh, that journey. So it is my wife sitting here. How many years old is it? Shape will be 12 years old. 12, 12 years old. So, um, so 12 years ago, my wife comes to me <laughs> slams me against the wall and says, you help everybody, but you're not helping me. And I go, well, I don't know about slamming. <laughs> well, <laughs> it sounds way more dramatic when you say it like that. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you know, you're helping everybody, you're not helping me. And I said, well, hon, there's nothing wrong with you. And she said, I can't lose weight. And a beautiful woman. And, and I said all the right husband things. I love you. You're great. It didn't matter. It's how those blue jeans fit. And this is a very intelligent woman that came down to how those blue jeans fit. And I, and I, I hate weight loss programs. They're all toxic. They're all built on incorrect principles. They all work until you quit. And if they, if you just gain the weight back, that was one thing. But I noticed that when people went on these aggressive diets, let's use Atkins as an example, they just crushed it. Um, the guy starts at 240, goes on it, and just in moments, he's 200 pounds, and then eats a piece of bread. And then within three months, he goes back to 240, and then he goes to 260. So you end up losing ground. So now it's my wife, who I love. And I thought, ouch, I got I to gotta figure this thing out. So I hit the books, and I, I build shape on two premises. Number one, all diets fail. Number two, it can't be just metabolic. It's got to be, certainly there's thyroid and that kind of stuff, but but so often there's not. And so I thought it had to be something else. I had been studying the, the adrenals a lot at that time and, and the endocrine system, but I, through some reading and research I did, I felt it was the brain. So then I had to go back, why do all diets fail? And my, in that realm of thinking, I thought it's because the brain gets a message that it's starving. So again, let's use the Atkins diet, which I've used it and it's very effective. And if I want to take somebody in the blood sugar situation and change the ketogenic type diet can, can have a powerful effect. But it was that gaining that extra weight was the, the hook that got me just thinking what this is all about. So it comes down to a part of the brain called the hype, well, the, the limbic system of the brain. And really it's your hypothalamus pituitary gland. They kind of talk to each other and they talk things over and then they send messages. And those messages are hormonal in nature. They'll send to the thyroid, the thyroid stimulant hormone, to the ovaries, the follicle stimulant hormone, the luteinizing hormone, to the adrenals, ACTH. So it's sending out all these messages, but what if that communication system isn't working right? Could things go awry because that didn't happen? And that was the basis of what I built shape on. So I built a formula. The HCG diet was very popular. This 500 calorie diet uh, it was popular in those days, which, you know, as a, as a physician, your brain goes, goes tilt. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. But then I studied about HCG and I went, well, that's an interesting thing. It's, it's elevated during pregnancy. So why? Well, one of its functions is to allow the mother's body to use fat cell storage for energy for this baby. So the mom's puking her guts out for nine months with morning sickness and the baby comes out looking a fat little Buddha-like thing. Well, the mother is basically sacrificed through this mechanism that our creator put in her body. And that's what the HCG, HCG diet was built on, human chorionic gonadotrophin. And this was Dr. Simeon in his work and he did it in hospitals and he injected people with uh, HCG and it was profoundly effective. So I, I, I hung on to that kind of thinking and I, I knew that starvation was the weakness in all diets, that when, that when the brain got a message, it's starving, you could lose the weight until you stop. And then it came back. And then there's something called a set point, which is what is offended when you starve. The body says, you, you, you starve me. I'm going to bring you back to where it's supposed to be. And then I'm going to take you a few pounds more. And my wife's got her hand on my leg. Well, <clears throat> I just wanted to, to chime in and add that <clears throat> we certainly have seen more than our fair share of people that have done HCG, HCG dieting and um it messes up their hormone system yes. so bad. Really bad so it's not healthy on on so many levels so i i figured 
I had to figure out how can I spot starvation? And that's where I came across this. I studied urine analysis through lots of different things. So we do a dye screen 10, a simple urine dip stick. Um, I use this, I built this formula called Shape Reclaimed. And um, we, we do restrict your caloric intake somewhat and it's very anti-inflammatory. So what happened was um, we, we used this urine analysis, five of the 10 things indicate starvation, urobilinogen, bilirubin, protein, specific gravity, and of course, ketones. Atkins one is your large ketosis, which is starvation. Trace small or moderate is great fat burning. Large is not good. It causes starvation. So it started with that as this weight loss program and Linda crushed it. And then all of a sudden I was playing with lots of different patients and uh, I decided to make my own formula which is an expensive thing to do. You can't just buy 24 bottles. I had to buy a thousand bottles. And that was a scary moment because I'm, I'm closer to the end of my career than the, in the beginning. And I tell my wife that I'm going to, I'm going to invent a formula. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, we're not ready for that. I remember getting the credit card. We put all, you know, as a physician, you put everything on your credit card to get frequent five miles. And, and it was crazy. Yeah. It came and I opened it up and it was scary. I had nausea looking at how much I just put on my credit card. <laughs> I said, we have this kind of limit. And she says, yeah, but this better work. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, suffice to say, I bought a thousand bottles because that's the minimum you could buy. And I began working with uh, my patients and then other doctors in the St. Louis area heard about me because I lecture for the st state for license renewal. Um, and pretty soon I got a company and it turns into now a national company. And um, we change lives. You know, it, it's the most incredible thing. But here's the amazing thing. It was built as a weight loss program for my menopausal wife, and it was fantastic. But all of a sudden, blood sugar plummeted, blood pressure plummeted, emotions improved. My success with type 2 diabetes was 100%. I didn't fail. You do the program. I, I, I had to take people off injectable insulin. My first 30 years of practice, I never took anybody off injectable insulin. It was common to do it when I, when I had people did it. And it was lifestyle stuff. Most of these things are lifestyle and they changed their relationship with food. So we de-emphasize the weight loss because the U S government doesn't like weight loss programs because they're, because they're crappy. <laughs> they're, they're filled with bad, bad, people that are doing and bad, bad and, and they recommend Toxic bad foods. foods. So what we ended up doing, um, we saw anti-inflammation, we saw immuno enhancement, we saw mild detoxification with a side effect of weight loss. And it just was the most remarkable thing. So we've got close to 500 practitioners across the United States. And uh, it's just been- Some uh, in Canada. I think we've got about six in Canada. Six in Canada. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hard to get it across the border. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it, it just, it was a game changer. And our tagline is we change lives. And the, the fun part for me at this point in my life is- Everybody wins. Um, the patient wins because they got this toxic uh, inflammatory weight that comes off. The practitioner wins because they get success having a patient. They, that patient refers. They're financially rewarded. And then I get to meet all these wonderful practitioners that I, I never would, would, was going to meet. Interesting story. If I, and tell me to shut up if, you, if I need to. But uh, I, I had this dream that I needed to... Um, I, I needed to, uh, um, in the dream, I had to see f uh, 500 people every 15 minutes. And it was a James Earl Jones voice. It wasn't a dream. It was a command. It was just God saying, you got to see 500 people every 15 minutes. And I thought, well, I'm good, <laughs> but I, I, I ain't that good. I, I, I'm, I'm fast and I'm, I help people. I can do it very quickly. I, I average 50, I actually once, at one time I averaged 85 patient visits a day. That was insanity, but, wow. um, but it oh. haunted me and I was, I had to go license renewal. I hate license renewal because they teach crap that I don't want to do. And so I, I bring a couple of books and I read and I sit, get my hours and, and move on, which is what most people do. So this particular time, the guys that are running the show come up to me and said, Dr. Frisch, um, I, I was there for a class on, uh, on, diagnosis on uh, some kind of different kind of diagnosis. I oh, this might actually be interesting. So these people come up to me at 1130 and said, Dr. Frisch, would you at all be interested in lecturing for the state of Missouri for license renewal? And I'm thinking, no, <laughs> number one, you know, they don't teach anything you like. Everybody hates your guts. Nobody wants to be there. It's just bad energy. And I go, what do you need? They go, we need you to teach at 12 o'clock today. And I go, 
what happened to Dr. So-and-so? Oh, his kidneys feel he's on dialysis. <laughs> and I said, well, why would you do that? And they said, well, we think you do some different kind of holistic diagnosis. And whatnot. And I said, I, 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 they said, what do you mean? I said, in, that, in those days, there was no PowerPoint. I said, I, I need an overhead projector. I, I, I can do it. So I, I winged a four-hour lecture. <laughs> I, 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 you know, yeah, it was just, it was an amazing thing. But I'm... Um, I must have done a good job because they called on Monday and said, can Dr. Frisch teach at our next thing? Because we get, a lot of, we get a lot of phone calls after these things, people complaining, but we never got this kind of phone call. I, I don't really remember what I taught other than I took, said a little prayer. <laughs> I unloaded my bladder and I, and I talked <laughs> for four hours. <laughs> uh, but after four or five of these, I'm driving home and I just tear up thinking, I can in fact see 500 people every 15 minutes if I teach other doctors. And it was just a, a, a massively powerful moment in my life as I was driving Highway 94 back to my home in Defiance, Missouri. So now um, time goes by and I have the same voice. And this voice says, I have to see 5,000 people every 15 minutes. And now I thought, okay, I'll lecture more. And I, I began lecturing for all these different vitamin companies. And there's a German homeopathic company called Heal. I made trauma ointment. I lectured in seven cities in nine nine weeks. It was just brutal, and I, I have a wife who's not happy now. <laughs> but I have this. Well, we I have this. Down. Yeah, we were burning out. Yeah, awesome. um, and I, it was it was just an exhausting kind of thing. I enjoyed teaching and mentoring, but it was exhausting. And then Shape Reclaim came, and I, I think I'm a moment away from 5,000 people every 15 minutes. Uh, I, I'm looking forward for the next dream. <laughs> mm. I like to dream. Yeah. And what a beautiful story of just listening, whether it's that voice that you hear or that intuition that shows up that guides us to this place that we often sometimes can block because of our fears or this inability to discern what is truth and what isn't for us. So just being able to listen can bring you to the space of being able to dream because a lot of that has been, you know, taken away, especially in these last couple of years for many individuals, but to have this story to kind of lean back into that dreaming is possible. And then you just put one foot after the other and just listen along the way that you can create changes. You can create that ripple effect in so many different areas of your life and somebody else's life. You know, we, we've kind of lost hope this last couple of years. Uh, I, I see things that are so egregious and so wrong and so evil and so sinister. And I, I see people losing hope. And mm -hmm. um, um, I remember hearing uh, Bernie Siegel give a talk. Uh, I was in, we were in New York, I believe. And he talked about these two oncologists, equally trained, equally brilliant, equally um, gifted in their ability to help people. And both of them used the same formula. One had dramatic success and the other guy had adequate success. And he went and sat and watched them both work. And the one said, look, uh, I'm going to give you these chemicals. There's four homey, uh, There's four uh, chemotherapeutic agents we're going to give you. They're, they're going to kill some bad cells, sadly you're going to kill some good cells and, um, and you know, may not feel so good, but you know, it should help you. And the other guy said basically the same thing. He says, but the interesting thing, these four chemotherapeutic agents, if you take the first letter of each, they spell the word hope. <laughs> and mm. That's the guy that had greater success. So um, I think giving hope um, I'll share my own story about hope. Um, my, my first two children died. Um, you can't think of anything worse than that. Um, and when the first one lived about 20 minutes, um, didn't breathe, didn't, wasn't revived. The second one lived, I was in college at the time, and he was revived, didn't breathe, was revived. Um, never cried, uh, never stopped, had a feeding with an NG tube. And uh, we had a husband and wife pediatric team. He was wonderful. She was Satan's daughter. She, she, she was the most awful human being I'd ever met. And, um, and uh, when he quit breathing the, the last time we were rushing him off to the hospital, uh, this was a common thing. Um, we got in the uh, ER and Sadly, Satan's daughter was the on-call doctor that was there, the pe pediatric uh, specialist, and um, they told me to get out of the uh, out of the uh, ER. And I said no. And they said, "Well, 
you know, we don't want you making a scene. I said, you want a scene? Try pulling me out of here. That baby dies, he'll die my arms. And uh, and so they left me alone and um, they were working on, uh, his name's Brady. And um, a nurse asked me a question. I answered and this, and this doctor, Satan's, Satan's daughter, doctor, turned around. She's about five, five, one, had little dark bangs that came to a point. I can't even look at that hairdo to this day. It, it causes rage in my body. She looks up at me and, and yeah, I'm six, two. And she says, you realize there's no hope here. And I, I looked at it and I went, I watched my right arm leave my body and go for her neck. <laughs> and, and I think God would have said, well done, my faithful servant. This, this lady needs to go. Um, and, you know, as bad as that a moment in my life was, um, kind of set the tone for who I am. Uh, I, I can't take away hope. I, even if I know this person's got 15 minutes to live, mm -hmm. I'm not going to share that with them because I believe in greater powers and I believe um, miracles happen. I believe in miracles and I believe in hope. Um, mm -hmm. Bible Bible talks lots of things about hope. But in the second last book of the Old Testament, it says we should become prisoners of hope. And King David said we should, we should pitch our tents in the land of hope. So I, I, I think um, I think we offer hope, and mm -hmm. and more than anything, that has healing power, and and that's why this is such a sinister thing because they've taken away hope from so many people. We're pitting families. We're trusting our government. We don't trust our family, friends, and neighbors. What's that about? You know, mm -hmm. it's it's wrong. However, I believe in humankind. I believe in the power that we have to make a difference here. And I think we're going to come out of this stronger people. Mm. That's my yeah. hope. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that story with us. It's an incredible well, story. Mm -hmm. It really is. And, you know, and, and it speaks to the, to the character and the kind of doctor you are. And, you know, and I think of like a, a, a situation like that, that gets imprinted into your, <clears throat> into your heart and your consciousness. And, and, and you found a way to, to take that tragedy and, and birth some, some hope into it just just you sharing just right now and and no doubt that's a part of how you show up for your patients and practitioners yeah. and other doctors i mean that you know it's interesting because that it's almost like in the conventional system there's this need not to give hope because you're setting maybe a false expectation for someone you don't want to let them down like it it's such a backwards way of thinking and um i mean obviously you want to be real with people sure. but but you, if, if you if you miss out on that, you know, you call it a placebo response, but call it love, call it a, an, a, an integral part of the healing process. If you if you take that out of the calculation, you're missing a huge piece of that that resolve for that individual. I think it's also because of that um, false relationship between doctor and patient. Doctors yeah. have been put on pedestals to be the saviors. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, I think what we're speaking to is like, how do we meet them where they're at so we can support and elevate them, be the forklift rather than someone that is going to save them and be that rescuer. So now we entangle them into this state of victimhood because we are going yep. to rescue them. So I think hmm. it's just reframing that. And when you are the forklift, the only option you have is to give hope. So I think yep. that is the difference. And, you know, even those listening really, tuning into how they receive information when they're in front of their doctors, like, are they victim to what the doctor is telling them? Or are they becoming empowered? Like you said, in the ER, like, there's no way I'm staying out here. But how many other individuals would have probably just listened because they're so used to obeying the command of the, that individual with the white coat, right? So I think it's changing that relationship. And the paradigm now is changing, people are taking more ownership or responsibility yeah. of their health too. And I think the more we do that, the more we won't find ourselves in the situation we have these last two years. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, self-responsibility, you know, is the key. And, and we've actually taught them not to be responsible for the health. You know, when I, I, I used to teach these classes called spotlight and I would do it for the public. Um, my patients would come and I, I did a mother's, um, uh, I can't remember what the name of it was, the mom's seminar, I think it was called. Um, but I, you know, one of the things I said, it, if you don't take time to, for making a child healthy, you're going to take time as a, as a sick adult, you know? So 
instituting a healthy approach early on is, is so important. And I, I like what's happening. Everybody um, is jumping on our bandwagon now. I mean, when I started, I was a quack. Mm -hmm. And now, um, you know, now I'm teaching in all these uh, different venues and uh, uh, for things I was called uh, a quack. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm smart. <laughs> you know, I didn't you know, uh, other people learn that there is value to that. And again, uh, wouldn't it be nice if people came to us uh, for preventative medicine, like we teach, instead of waiting for something to go wrong? Again, you have to be two thirds sick in my whole philosophy before medicine sees anything wrong. That's sometimes too far down the road. And that's why looking at what's not right, using um, facial diagnosis to help you to pick and choose the direction you want to support that patient. If they do have long sided headaches and they, they have a lot of tension up between the shoulder blades and they have a very angry look, they probably got a liver gallbladder problem. Perhaps some milk thistle would be a good idea. Perhaps cutting back on that alcohol um, might not be a bad idea. And you can actually uh, show them facially what's what they're starting to put into their body and it's going to send a message for an organ to dysfunction. And let's change it. And you will see changes in the face. It, it, it's a, a remarkable uh, thing to watch happen when, when a patient gets it. I had so many people that I would, I would, I did a very thorough exam. Uh, I did an extensive report of findings and I would watch people in that report of findings, just get it. And they would just start getting well. I always got credit, which was wonderful as a physician. <laughs> you know, they would give me the credit for it, but they they did all the work because their brain says, I have an option here. I can do something to change my health. That's pretty exciting to see a patient discover that for the mm -hmm. sometimes for the first time in their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I had that experience just the other day, a patient, and you know, you don't realize just the things that you say and how powerful words are. And she was in tears she had been diagnosed with Hashimoto's at age 12 and was basically sentenced that this would be with her for the rest of her life. And now in her 20s, she reached out to me and she's like, no one's ever spoken to me about other options and the fact that I don't have to live with this for the rest of my life. And I had no idea that that's what all I did was instill hope. We still haven't even started a treatment or done anything, but just that has given her that ability to step into herself even more. How much farther on the road to recovery is she now simply because those words were spoken? Mm -hmm. Words are so powerful. And our last time we did the daddy, um, daddy doctor thing, I talked about um, <laughs> our doctor daddy. No, 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 I, no, I, I love it. Daddy doctor. Daddy doctor. <laughs> so okay. Whatever. Whatever. I'm an old guy. Come on. Give me yeah, yeah, some slack. Uh, we talked about um, everything has a vibrational rate. We talked about the word love having a vibrational rate of 528. It's measured. It's measurable. It's uh, 528 hertz is the word love. Um, conversely, the word hate has a vibration rate of about 100. And when I would explain it, in the beginning, I didn't explain to patients what I was doing because I thought I would remove all doubt from mind that I was crazy and they would never come back. So I never shared with them that I was, I was using an energetic technique that literally put their body into a state of 528. And when I began telling patients, patients finally say, Dr. Todd, what are you doing? You know, I, I come in here, you do these weird things. I don't understand it, but I go away feeling better and I keep getting better. And I began explaining, oh, it's about energy. And I did acupuncture and my whole goal was to get them uh, into a balanced state of, of 528. But I would explain to them, um, disease has vibrational rates. Cancer, for instance, has vibration, depending on the cancer of, um, of 40 to 100. So if hate is a big part of your life, then you're bringing your body down to a level that cancer says, I can live here comfortably and not be suppressed in any way. So our answer to all these people that are so hateful, walk through an airport, talk about a lack of pleasantness. My goodness, I, I'll drive anywhere now. I, I want them to build a highway to, to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it, it's just an awful experience in, in an airport. Everybody's hateful. Get that mask above your nose. I sit next to a guy in an airplane. He's got this big, long pretzel, about eight inches long, about a half inch in diameter. He had not stick in his mouth the whole time. And I go, you're not eating that, are you? He goes, no. I said, you're putting that in your mouth so nobody bugs you, right? He goes, nobody's bugged me, have they? <laughs> I said, the guy like, last one. So, I mean, people are coming up with these things and, and the, the stupidity of these masks 
goes beyond comprehension. Now, anybody with any medical training can buy into this crap is beyond my comprehension. That being said, it, it has permeated uh, in an airport that it's just an ugly experience. People are hateful and they're mean spirited and nobody's pleasant anymore. And can't, we've lost the ability to disagree without becoming disagreeable. And I'm guilty of it too. I, I mean, I lose my crap. I quit watching the news last October simply because I go, I don't believe any of this stuff and I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to let it into my head and affect my ability to show love to someone else. Still hard to do, man. I tell you, I wish I had sure that. But you know, what's you know, it's interesting though, be, you know, as you're, as you're saying that, I mean, I, I can't help but feel, you know, that mask is, is actually, it's almost like, it's almost like creating this more artificial world. You know, we, we can, mm -hmm. you know, Twitter is like, you know, cesspool of communication, you know, uh, when, when someone, you know, shares a comment, it's like just littered with disgruntled people and just, you know, spitting their, um, you know, hateful words or whatever it may be, you know, in comment section. And, and I feel like that, that mask is actually creating this barrier that allows us to be more in this digital world as well. So we don't have to really show who we are. We're physically blocking an yeah. aspect of who we are. Mm -hmm. And and it's, isn't it just mind blowing when, when you just meet someone and then you see them with their mask off and you go, Oh my goodness, I literally thought you, you were going to look completely a, different. Right? <laughs> As a facial diagnostician, what do you think it does to me? Yeah. How do you think, but let's, let's, let's get it real, real, personal here what do you think a seven-year-old kid sitting in class that never sees his teacher smile you think there's any emotional impact there yeah. it's just this 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 is so sinister and yet so brilliant and you take something so well, we got to be six feet apart so there's some interesting things we have a we have an electromagnetic field around all of us and it's measurable and um, they did a measurement on, on the Dalai Lama. It was 20, 20, 39 feet. That's, how, wow. that's his electromagnetic field. But for the average person, this electromagnetic field is what we use to choose a mate, to choose a friend, or choose someone not to be friends with. And the average human, that is that, that electromagnetic field is measured at three to five feet. How far do they want us apart? Mm, Does that so just set a chill? You know, I I had some snotty kid at, at at Hobby Lobby. I'm buying three Christmas ornaments, and I'm not. I'm, I'm my toes are over my marked spot, and he yells at me, and in a very vile way. <laughs> right. Now the lady in front of me was morbidly obese, and her butt was three feet on her towards me, but didn't yell at her. I got yelled at for my toes being over the line, and I. Well, I had a hard time showing love. Mm. I, I didn't show hate. Didn't show love to that kid either. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it's, it's sinister, but truth will win. And the human, the human species is great. There, there are awful people. And the problem with today is awful people get more press than people that are doing good. And uh, probably always spend that way. It's just much more... Um, horrible right now because of mm. the way we communicate. So many more yeah, ways to communicate. Social media has really heightened horrible. it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, in closing, um, the question that we like to ask. I, I don't um, want to close. I know. Uh, we don't <laughs> I know want to go we either. talk for so long. <laughs> <laughs> we have to get you back on here. Yeah, <laughs> That's what be needs part to happen. Two. Be part we two. should do a part two. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe you've already answered this, but what we'd like to ask is if you knew that tomorrow was your last day on this earth, what imprint would you like to leave? You know, the uh, again, um, had a had a moment um, in my life. I was in a dark time in my life. I had a pretty serious disease. My marriage had fallen apart, um, and I was. Uh, I like to do very difficult crossword puzzles and different puzzles. And in the underneath the crossword puzzle in the St. Louis Post Dispatch, there's something called a crypt equip, and it's we have to substitute letters. And I, I'm good at these things. I'm like it's like a beautiful mind. These things just appear, and I. And I I decode this message in this particular, I, I couldn't decode it, but there was an interesting thing about this. And I could just look a couple pages later, it gives the answer, but I would never do that as a buckethead. That would be the, the mortal sin. But there was a seven letter word and an eight letter word. And the last six letters were identical. And I, I thought this is where I'm going to figure it out. Um, and, 
after getting out my the Scrabble game and putting the letters out and trying to figure this out, the last letters, uh, the six letters, um, the last six letters of both words were L L N E S S. The eight letter word was wellness and the seven letter word was illness. And then it became clear to me. And the way you change illness to wellness is you change the I to we. So my message, I would try to talk to people about being a we because I, you'll get ill when you, when you're a we will be well. Mm, that's beautiful. Love it, Todd. You're, you're such a, you're, you're, you're a big heart, so much wisdom. I mean, you know, to, to your comment that you made earlier about that heart and that brain being uh, an intric- intricate uh, connection and of the same tissue. I mean, clearly you embody that in such a big, big way. So thank you so much for blessing us with, with that, uh, with that everything you shared today. All you got to do is live 70 years on this earth and it's an automatic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure we're going to go way past that too, right? I mean, this is just... Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's just My the wife beginning. Won't let me die. It's the beginning of the beginning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Todd. Thank you, Linda. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll, we'll have to have you back and dive into some more of these uh, important concepts. So thank you again. Happy to do so. Thanks. Thanks.